Good afternoon. I'm Ian Wardropper, director of the Frick Collection. I'm glad to welcome you all here to help us celebrate the 80th birthday party of the Frick. The weeks leading to the opening, uh, the public opening of the Frick on December 16, 1935, were a flurry of activity. No detail, however small, could be overlooked. The Committee on Organization and Policy, everybody has to have a committee, had decided on October 15th to label the pictures and works of art as inconspicuously as possible with, quote, cardboard labels of dull gold to match the frames with black lettering placed where possible at the lower right corner of the frames. These would be most effective, dignified, and simple. So here you see the Oval Room um, in 1935. You can barely see the labels. New Klegel reflectors were chosen for more even illumination of the larger pictures. Mr. Griggs, a trustee, felt that the reds of velvet upholstered furniture rented for the occasion were too strong and, quote, killed the reds of the Whistlers and the Velasquez. So you can see in this contemporary view they um, removed the red upholstered furniture so it wouldn't clash with the paintings. Color continued to concern the Frick. Consolidated florists of Madison and 67th Street supplied Lily of the Valley and Forget-Me-Nots for the Boucher Room, American Beauty Roses in the West Gallery, and Red Camellias in the Library. Anthurium was placed under what was referred to as the Red Cap Titian, a playful gesture linking the flat red flower native to Ecuador and Colombia with the shape of the young man's cap. Fifteen cloakroom employees of the highest integrity and honesty were hired. Fifteen guards were engaged, and a letter was dispatched to Captain Thomas Mulligan of the 19th Precinct to ask permission to obtain and use four tear gas guns. Apparently, the tear gas did not have to be used, but anticipated large crowds did concern officials at the Frick. There was a private view for 700 people to see the collection before the public opening. The Herald Tribune published the name of all 700 visitors beginning on the first page of its December 12th edition. A long pent-up desire to see the treasures of the Frick was only natural considering that the New York Herald Tribune had described it as, quote, almost hermetically sealed since Mr. Frick's death in 1919, while Mrs. Frick occupied the house and while it was being altered and enlarged. An extraordinary group of public officials and dignitaries came to the event on December 11. Notable among these were Andrew W. Mellon, um, the associate of Mr. Frick's youth, who began his own remarkable art collection at the suggestion of his friend, and John D. Rockefeller, co-trustee of the collection with Mr. Mellon, co-trustee co of the Frick collection. The New York World Telegram headline read, Carnegie's at preview of Frick Mansion. They join the throng of sable-wrapped dowagers in viewing treasures left to the city. I guess we don't need fur coats today. Famously, Frick and Carnegie had quarreled. So much, so much was made of Carnegie's widow and daughter, quote, good-naturedly burying the hatchet. The decisions made for public access were, of course, the most consequential for the future of the Frick as a museum. At his death in New York on December 12, 1919, Frick had bequeathed his art to form a corporation to be known as the Frick Collection, quote, for the purpose of establishing and maintaining a gallery of art in his former residence and of, quote, encouraging and developing the study of the fine arts and of advancing the general knowledge of kindred subjects to the end that uh, the same shall be a public gallery of art to which the entire public shall forever have access subject only to reasonable regulations. The trustees decided to enlarge the Carriere and Hastings house um, before they opened to the public in 1935. Here's uh, the original house shortly after it was built. This is uh, a plan uh, of the way it looked. You may know that um, here is Fifth Avenue, that originally it was accessed off of a, a road off of 70th Street. There was a porte cochere here and one came into the mansion uh, through this place. Your carriage would continue on into what was then an open court and out to 71st Street. Um, and here you're seeing the first library that was built in 1924. 
By the time that the trustees and the family had the responsibility of executing Henry Clay Frick's will, they decided they needed more public space. So they um, hired the architect John Russell Pope to add basically what you see enclosed in this, this red dotted line. The garden court was uh, transformed out of what had been an open courtyard, the oval room, which I showed you a picture of earlier, the east gallery, what was then called the lecture room, now called the music room, where we're now seated, uh, and here um, the final library that was uh, built in 1935. John Russell Pope um, significantly was um, the architect uh, later selected by uh, Frick's friend, uh, Andrew Mellon, to build the National Gallery in Washington. Um, it was completed in 1941, um, shortly after uh, the architect's death. Um, and there's relatively little relation on the exterior of the National Gallery to the exterior of the Frick collection. It's more in the interior that one begins to see um, relationships. On the uh, upper image, you see an interior courtyard of the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, and below, you see um, the garden court here, just outside where we're sitting. Construction uh, went apace during the years of uh, 1932 to 1934. Here you see uh, a view from 71st Street uh, of the library, um, and you see it going, rising adjacent to the original library that was, uh, was completed in 1924. Um, and here you see uh, beginning of the exterior wall that would be outside of uh, oh, the East Gallery uh, and Oval Room. Um, and so this was then later demolished to make room uh, for the room that we're now sitting in. So here's an image of the very room that we're in in the middle of construction. Um, the library, um, which was started by Helen Clay Frick uh, in 1920 in honor of her father, is today one of the top five art research libraries in the world. Um, and is significant for the number of unique books and manuscripts uh, it possesses that cannot be found in any other library in what's called the WorldCat system, and of its unrivaled strength in uh, provenance research resources. Um, it's increasingly a, a leader in digital history, art history as well, uh, and digita digitization of archives and art historical texts. It's come a long way from the auto text system which you see here, this was cutting edge in 1935 where you could uh, write on a piece of paper on the seventh floor and it could be transmitted to a page on the uh, fourth floor so the book could be brought up to you. Um, of course, for me to make this lecture, um, this black and white photograph was scanned, digitally sent to me as I was putting it together for a PowerPoint. Um, I, was able to draw images from um, our own website and, and access information about it uh, and access information from the entire web. Uh, and of course, the library uh, is increasingly making all of its resources available uh, digitally um, so that you will still want to come to the library to access many of its unique volumes, um, but increasingly, we're making its resources available to the public internationally. I often feel I should also remind the audience that the library is um, free and it's open to the public. In researching the lecture, I came across the following statement from the December 11th, 1935 press release. I'm showing you one of the first tickets to the Frick collection that was used in 1935. And this press release statement distills the mission and quality of the Frick and is worth reading, I think, three paragraphs devoted to the heading, Conception Adopted. Making the Frick Collection available to the public implied more than merely opening the doors and treating the building and its furnishings as a museum. The collection does not aim at competing with vast institutions that attempt to illustrate the art of every country and period. The house was primarily a home. From the beginning, it was seen that to apply to it a technique that would necessitate exhibiting its works of art in surroundings stripped of their individuality and furnishings would alter irreparably its meaning and appeal. Every epoch, in its more active and personal aspects, tends to reuse the arts of the past in new combinations as part of a living whole. 
The trustees foresaw in the Frick Collection an example of American domestic architecture and life in the early 20th century, comparable to the houses of the 18th and early 19th centuries, which are now being preserved as historical monuments. Remember, this is 1935. The mansion itself, designed in 1913 by Carrere and Hastings, was a work of art of its period. In other words, there was an, an historical factor in the house and in the way in which its works of art were arranged that surpassed in interest any possible methodological or chronological grouping of the paintings and sculpture. Consequently, in planning to open the collection to the public, the trustees felt that its residential character should be maintained and that only such alterations should be made as might be counseled by administrative necessities or that would make possible an easy uh, one-way circulation of a large number of visitors. So this is just uh, to remember that we may take for granted the way that the Frick looks today, but there was considerable debate within the Frick of whether one should have, for example, a chronological um, display of the collection or indeed how it would be shown to the public. The philosophy of display still characterizes the Frick, um, but happily the strict circulation system was abandoned. In the living hall, which you see here, German, Spanish, and Italian paintings mixed with French Rococo furniture, Italian Renaissance bronzes, Chinese porcelain, and a Persian carpet. This reflects the individual sensibility of a collector rather than the systematic organization of a museum. These are paintings that forcefully appealed to him. They all happen to be 16th century in this room, all male and of a severe character. Um, Aretino is oddly libertine in this company of saints. Francis, Jerome, uh, and interestingly, Moore was canonized in 1935. These are all strong personalities except for the winsome youth of, by Titian that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. Frick concentrate on, concentrated on acquiring decorative arts only when he was in the process of designing and building his house. But once he did, he threw himself wholeheartedly into acquiring furnishings which would be the equal in quality um, to his paintings, though he chose to focus on periods such as the Italian Renaissance for Cassoni uh, or bronzes uh, or French 18th century furniture, which would complement um, the works painted on panel or canvas. The outlier, Chinese porcelain, was a favorite collectible at the time, and he indulged himself by spending huge sums for pieces that added a range and eclectic quality to his decor. This did not mean that the national, national groupings were completely eschewed. Uh, in the library, for example, um, and I think uh, even just black and white versus color clues you into uh, the 80 year difference. Um, the library walls were made free for hanging by deliberately short bookcases. This is something that uh, Frick was, was absolutely essential to Frick and in his injunctions to architects that the art collection came first and he was always looking to make room for, uh, for paintings and for works of art. Uh, the walls of the library were covered uh, nearly exclusively with English paintings in 1935. Uh, the posthumous portrait of Frick that you see in the lower image over the fireplace by a Norwegian uh, American artist was added only in the 1940s. The Great West Gallery was always intended to be the site for some of the largest and grandest paintings. In fact, he started buying for the scale uh, of the room in his last decade. Smaller pictures, even of the caliber of Vermeer, were placed over large ones. Skying was the contemporary term used for um, putting smaller pictures over larger pictures in salons, um, permitting more works to be shown, of course, but adding difficulty for the visitors um, to look at pictures um, at that height and from the required visitor's path that you see in the, uh, which was prevalent in the Frick in its early decades that you see in the, the uh, image at the top. As the administration became more comfortable with the collection's capacity to handle the number of visitors, over the years, the stanchions were gradually withdrawn. Only in the last 10 years were they removed altogether from the West Gallery so one can walk on the carpet and approach the tables and bronzes in the center. This was crucially important for the experience of the Frick. Visitors could now approach closely to look at any work of art. Removing the stanchions also allowed the visitors to wander uh, where they wished. So you see initially in 1935 and for many years, um, the direction in, enforced was a counterclockwise
clockwise m movement um, through the building, um, which I always find interesting because you know I think really one's natural inclination is to to go the other direction to go what was the direction of the living hall from the dining room to uh, what was then the drawing room to the living room to the library and to the west gallery um, and of course we allow visitors now to go in any direction that they choose. Another important part about the display uh, is that it was not fixed. Frick left no instructions that the collection had to remain exactly as he left it or in the places where he chose for them. Um, unlike, for example, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum that you see here, um, or uh, the Barnes Collection, uh, in which case both of the collectors left explicit instructions that everything had to be exactly where they had placed. Um, at the Frick, there was more of an intuitive sense of what looks good, in which rooms, and of course in Frick's day he was buying a pace and things were constantly moving around uh, up until the day in which he died. Uh, it's important to note also that the collection continues to grow and change uh, as, the Frick, as Frick intended. Two paintings acquired in 1927, so that's eight years after Henry Clay Frick's death, eight years before the Frick opened to the public in 1935, these two paintings illustrate the continued search for works of art of the highest level of quality, uh, but also the institution's willingness to undertake new directions. This uh, Duccio, The Temptation of Christ on the Mountain of 1308-11, a temper on panel, is one of the most important paintings in the collection. Um, and yet early Renaissance gold ground paintings had not been an area of special appeal to the founder. It was rather his daughter, Helen Clay, um, who led the collection in this direction. This is a panel from the Maesta, which is a huge double-sided altar, uh, which once crowned uh, the high altar of the cathedral in Siena. Over the years, some of the panels which um, were dispersed, uh, such as this one, uh, and the entire altarpiece has now been moved into a museum adjacent to the cathedral in Siena. Um, well, originally this one panel was part of a series. Um, it's a striking example of Duccio's skill in composing a single scene. Here, Christ having been offered by the devil all of the kingdoms of the world, which you see charmingly depicted in these miniature towns dotted around, uh, if he will worship the devil, rejects him uh, before these cities um, and um, you see the hideous figure of, uh, of the devil uh, being cast out. Um, this is one of the most important early Italian masters. This painting set in motion acquisitions uh, of other works by Cimabue, Piero della Francesca, Paolo and Giovanni Veneziano, Gentili da Fabriano, that make the Frick today a great uh, site for 14th and 15th century Italian pictures. It set the stage for the arrival of our great Piero della Francesca, the St. John Evangelist, um, which was acquired just after the Frick opened to the public in, um, in 1936. Um, this is one of the only panels in America by this great painter of the Italian Renaissance, uh, as we demonstrated in an exhibition in uh, Piero della Francesca in America just a few years ago. Um, in 1454, Piero was commissioned to make a polyptych for the high altar of Sant'Agostino in his hometown of Borgo San Sepolcro. Uh, the central panel was lost, but lateral panels, such as this one of standing saints, survive. Uh, and the Frick uh, luckily was able to acquire two more panels from the structure uh, and uh, a crucifixion, a gift from uh, John D. Rockefeller. The other acquisition of 1927, which is a banner year, uh, was Ang's great Contest de Sonville of 1845, one of the greatest paintings of mid-19th century France. Again, this was not a period that had appealed particularly to the founder, to Henry Clay Frick, who had shown more interest in the Barbizon School and later 19th century works of France. Here again, we, here we see the granddaughter of the famous writer Madame de Stael, uh, an author in her own right, having just come home from an evening at the opera. Ang captures her in the intimacy of her private quarters with his extraordinary precision. And if you're wondering where she is, um, she's now at the Prado in Madrid, uh, where this picture with the Queen of Spain looking at her was taken just last week. 
Um, this picture led to other acquisitions, such as uh, David's Contes d'Aru of 1810, which is acquired uh, in 1937, um, filling out a context of French neoclassical and romantic artists of the first half of the 19th century. This painting was executed and signed 4 p.m., March 14, 1810, as a surprise for Comte Daru, who had obtained for David uh, his payment for Le Sacre, the coronation of Napoleon and Josephine. Painters often had trouble getting paid uh, in those days, uh, and David was very grateful for the intercession of Daru, and then therefore painted a, a portrait of the wife for him. Stendhal, the great writer, characterized this painting as, uh, or her, her character, her, um, her look in this painting as forceful, frank, and jolly. The Frick, of course, also built on the strength of its collection. Uh, Henry Clay Frick had acquired, for example, a bust by the greatest French 18th century marble portraitist, Houdon, uh, of uh, Madame, uh, de, uh, Madame de Caquela. Um, and uh, he actually arranged, I, th I think this is sort of symptomatic of the way that uh, Henry Clay Frick went about his acquisitions, which was very carefully. He arranged to get the two finest busts by Houdon, which were on the market, bring them to the Frick, uh, to his house, and lived with them for six months before he decided on this choice. Um, so this is really what, what we owe uh, our collection to, is a standard of quality and excellence set from the very beginning um, in careful selection of every work of art that was followed by his daughter, by the trustees, and by the institution to, to today. Um, this bust, uh, it was just the beginning of a kind of collection of works by Houdon. Uh, for example, this uh, life-size terracotta of Diana, which was bought in 1937, um, added to other busts and objects that we've acquired over the years, um, give us an extraordinary group uh, of works by one of the greatest sculptors of the 18th century. Um, another way the Frick has evolved is through gifts of entire collections. Uh, Henry Clay Frick had acquired a number of pieces of Chinese porcelain, mostly 18th and 19th century pieces, like uh, these two figures of ladies on stands, which are probably from Jingzhen. Uh, Femi Vert is the type that they're known as uh, after their translucent green glazes. Henry's son, Childs Frick, favored blue and white from the 16th century onward. Uh, and at his death, Childs' death in 1965, bequeathed 214 pieces, uh, creating an important group, um, oops, uh, such as the stem bowl, um, late 16th century. It's only four inches high, but uh, of extraordinary quality and precision, as you can see, uh, and depicts go scholars gathered near a pavilion in a garden. Um, in turn, this set a precedent for another collection. Henry Clay Frick had appreciated French 18th century porcelain. We currently, in our portico gallery, have uh, an exhibit of some of his Sev works, uh, and, uh, but we did not have any works from the earliest European factory to discover uh, the secret of making porcelain, that is, Meissen, uh, outside of Dresden in Germany. Uh, one of the greatest private collections of Meissen, uh, formed by uh, Henry Ar uh, Arnhold and his parents, uh, has been pledged to us, uh, and some of the stars, such as this great bustard, uh, I've already been given. You may know that Augustus the Strong, uh, King of Poland, um, was a, a fanatical about porcelain to the point that he um, actually paid for some porcelain with regiments of soldiers. Um, he also loved animals. He had a menagerie or a zoo of his own. He had collections of taxidermy. So he commissioned the Meissen factory to make originally over 500 um, life-size birds, mammals, and so on that would have decorated uh, his Japanese pavilion, as it was called. Um, he died before the commission could be finished, and um, somewhere around 300 were, were completed. Uh, but this is, I think, one of the grandest of them all, where you see um, this bir bird, which is some three feet high, delicately leaning its neck back uh, on, its structure, on, its, uh, on its back. Um, and um, it was a highly experimental um, idea to create these sculptures of animals at this scale. And you can see even in the firing cracks of the surface um, what a difficult task it was. But this is really one of the monuments of the history of porcelain. Uh, and we're very grateful and lucky to have this extraordinary collection of mice and coming to the Frick. Um, another example of collections coming to the Frick is in clocks. 
Um, Henry himself had acquired one of the masterpieces of French clockmakers, uh, this long case regulator clock and barometer of 1767, the clock by Lyotot, casework by Ferdinand Bertou, sculptural mounts by Philippe Caffieri. Um, but there were relatively few mates to this work in the Frick um, until 1999 when uh, Winthrop Kelly Eady gave his collection of some 40 clocks and watches from the 16th through the 19th centuries, uh, making this one of the uh, important sites for the specialized field. And I'm showing you here uh, a Boule clock uh, dating from around um, 1690 to 1700. Over the years, and it, um, we have uh, been able to acquire uh, works of great quality. This just this past year, um, a self-portrait by the Spanish 17th century artist Murillo um, that um, is one of only two self-portraits that are known. The other uh, is in the National Gallery in London. And um, it has an interesting story. It was actually bought by Frick in 1904. Uh, but Frick had, uh, in addition to this house and a mansion in Pittsburgh, where he came from originally, um, a kind of summer house, which was outside of Boston, some 110 rooms. And he collect, kept a number of works of art there. Uh, by and large, his most important works came here to New York. But the Murillo, for one reason or another, never came down to New York. Um, and we. Very fortunate, it descended through the family, and um, we're very grateful to uh, Mrs. Uh, Henry Clay Frick II, who gave this to us just this past year. Um, it's currently being conserved, and we've just got a wonderful new contemporary Spanish 17th century frame for it. Um, so just to make the point that the Frick continues to acquire uh, and at the highest level of quality. The Frick has evolved in other ways. We set a standard for publications in our collections catalogs. Uh, one of the first systematic catalogs of a collection produced uh, in the United States, the earliest one uh, begun in 1949, the Frick Collection Illustrated Catalog, uh, was revised in a series between 1968 and 2003 in which Frick curators and some of the most distinguished scholars around the world would contribute to the texts. Um, we continue, this really set a, a kind of gold standard for collections catalogs um, that is still influential today. The Frick continues to publish in a whole range of categories. Just this past year, we've uh, produced a, a handbook on decorative arts, a small um, book on our Limoges enamels collection of the 16th century, um, a small book called Director's Choice, um, which I will be signing after this lecture, um, and it's uh, it was a pleasure for me to write this book, Director's Choice, but it was also, also uh, a, a real challenge, and a challenge because of the nature of the collection. The, the series calls for a format of 37 works of, works of art that can be included, um, and the hardest thing was for me was to decide what to leave out. Um, I had to leave out personal favorites. I had to leave out absolute masterpieces in order to fit the 37 uh, objects. Obviously, it reflects some of my quirks and taste, but I also wanted to to give a sense of the range of the quality of the collection. Um, and it just served to remind me what an extraordinary institution that this is. Um, the Frick, um, also this past year, we produced um, a, a monograph on a single work of art, one of our greatest paintings, Giovanni Bellini's St. Francis in the Wilderness. Um, and so the, the range of the institutional publications from collections, catalogs, to handbooks, um, to catalogs of exhibitions um, has simply been getting better and better. Um, from the minimal labels on paintings and frames that I mentioned in 1935, the Frick has continued to expand the range of information that we provide through audio tours and increasingly through digital means uh, and the internet. We just uh, launched an app just a little over a year ago uh, which has information on every single object in the collection. Exhibitions have increasingly become an important part of our programming over the last several decades. In the early decades, the Frick might mount one exhibition a year. We now do between five and six a year. Our philosophy is to do small focused exhibitions that put our own works uh, into a deeper context for our visitors, whether it's borrowing a group of works from another institution to complement our own. Um, so here you see the Moritz House exhibition of a couple of years ago where Rembrandt's in the upper, uh, upper uh, image or Vermeer in the lower um, 
spoke to the paintings that we have here by those artists, or uh, more recently, the National Gallery uh, of Scotland, in which um, paintings by uh, Reynolds, Gainsborough, Rayburn uh, were in a gallery near where we had our own paintings by those artists, so you had a deeper sense of, of the achievement of each individual artist. Uh, more and more, we aspire to do exhibitions that will be a serious contribution to scholarship. Um, in this case, for example, um, three, some three years ago, we did an exhibition on the Italian Renaissance sculptor Antico, of which we have one object, uh, but we pulled together really what was one of the, the first major looks uh, at this talented sculptor uh, in bronze from the early uh, 16th century in Italy. Um, looking f uh, to the present, uh, I hope all of you have a chance to see um, the exhibition of uh, Andrea del Sarto, which focuses on his drawings, but in the room just outside, you have the opportunity to see the way in which drawings um, led the artist in the creative process to complete the finished paintings uh, which hang nearby. This is an exhibition we did with the J. Paul Getty Museum, but coming up, there's an extraordinary range of exhibitions that I think reflects the talent uh, of our curatorial staff. Uh, and our increasing wish to make a, a, a serious and solid contribution to the history of art. Um, the show that opens to the public in, I think, around the 1st of March uh, on, called Van Dyck, uh, The Anatomy of Portraiture, uh, will be the first show on this artist in this country in some 20 years, uh, and really the first major comprehensive look at, uh, at the artist in all the media that he used, from drawings to oil sketches, to the finished paintings, to in, uh, etchings, which were an important part of his process in recording um, and disseminating the images that he made. So uh, Frick loved Van Dyck. We have eight paintings by him, one of our own on the left, which you can see just outside in the East Gallery, and it will be shown with such works as um, this uh, painting on the right from the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, we have future shows. Uh, a small one on Antoine Watteau, an aspect of his work uh, of his military subjects, um, a great exhibition on Pierre Gutier, an important decorative artist of the French 18th century. Um, so the Frick has really become more and more, I think, a leader in um, old master exhibitions, uh, and we're very proud of what we've done in this area. Education also has increasingly become a part uh, of what we do. It was part of our mission uh, from the very beginning. Uh, as I said, he, Frick's will um, set forth that a goal was encouraging and developing the study of fine arts and in advancing the general knowledge of kindred subjects. Um, and this, the, with our educational programs and with the Frick Art Reference Library together, um, provide a, a great resource to the public. Um, as you see, early on, uh, our um, Offerings were relatively limited from concerts, lectures, symposia. Um, today we have a much wider range of offerings uh, and the education department now serves as many as 25,000 people a year in some 1,100 separate programs. What uh, the Frick does best, I think, are small focused uh, looks at individual works of art, whether it's to a, a group of high school students uh, or college students uh, in which uh, Rika Burnham and other members of the education department will lead people, guide them into a closer and closer look at a single work of art, um, seminars looking at uh, objects, um, and increasingly we uh, will uh, commission works of art in other art forms such as ballet uh, to put our own works of art in context. So what has changed uh, at the Frick over the past 80 years? Well, we averaged 100,000 people uh, in the early years uh, that we were open to the public. We now average about 300,000. Um, the lobby that was built in 1977 to try to address the increased attendance um, has simply not kept up um, to comfortably accommodate our visitors, nor the facilities of coat rooms and bathrooms are uh, equal to the task. So what you see in the Frick is a pattern of incremental growth. Our art holdings have grown steadily but surely and in directions that have decisively influenced the overall tone uh, of the collection within the parameters of late medieval to early 20th century that were set from the beginning. Recently, we have proposed opening up some of the second floor as a means to show more of the collection, uh, as well as to give our visitors a sense of the house as a family residence. 
Remarkably, this idea dates to the 1930s when the institution was first involved in the expansion of the John Russell Pope uh, building in which we're now sitting. Um, this was just a, a, a drawing that was made at, in 1932 um, that suggested that the second floor, um, this is currently my office, these, that was a boudoir of Mrs. Frick and these were bedrooms, uh, that this, these would be art galleries. Initially, the idea was to have the lecture hall that we're now sitting upstairs. Um, that didn't happen, but it was a very old idea to turn part of the second floor into display space. Uh, and so uh, my office, for example, we're now uh, proposing to turn into a public gallery, which will allow us to show more of the permanent collection which as it's grown has had, uh, has, we've been able to show less of uh, within the rooms. And the growth of the collection has primarily been in smaller scale objects, in decorative arts, in drawings, in cabinet pictures. Um, and the smaller scale of the second floor is ideally suited for that. We still have discrete labels in the corner of painting frames, but our catalogs and publications have steadily provided more information on the collection. And we are increasingly using new technology to transmit this information and to engage wider audiences. Our exhibitions have grown in importance. While they continue to deepen our visitors' knowledge about works of art in the collection, they are increasingly recognized internationally and make contributions to scholarship. Yet, we still lack a dedicated exhibition hall with ceiling heights permitting us to show paintings without removing parts of the permanent collection to do so, uh, as well as missing loading docks and unpacking areas that are necessary to receiving and preparing such shows. Our education programs have clearly grown in range as well as depth, uh, but we have no dedicated spaces for the education department. Finally, the staff has grown to meet the needs of our enlarged programs. Um, I am the eighth director, but you can see in this picture that was taken yesterday. Uh, fortunately, it's a warm winter, so uh, everybody was able to get outside without coats. Um, the staff has, has grown in order to meet all of the many um, activities and needs of the institution, um, and, we, and we need space for them as well. Um, what continues today uh, is the talent and the dedication of curators, conservators, educators, librarians, um, and as well as guards, facility operators, housekeepers, all the people who maintain the collection and library. These are all people who are uh, dedicated to the idea of the Frick uh, and proud of, of the excellence of the institution. What's not changed um, and will never change is the quality of the experience. It's a unique experience of a collection of the highest quality displayed within a distinguished residence, conserved, studied, and presented with the care and excellence that from the beginning was the founder's wish. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the 80th birthday of the Frick today.